at the bottom of your screen, there is a small box. It's got a little balloon and it says chat. I've got everybody muted tonight. So if you would like to ask a question, you're more than welcome to ask questions. And I'll be uh, reading those to Tim throughout. But just go ahead and type it in the chat box and hit send. Um, I think that's all. If you want to go ahead and get started, Tim. Outstanding. Thank you so much for having me, Carrie and Becky. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about backyard poultry production. So this is a class that I do uh, to different counties throughout. It's, it's more targeted towards the beginner, maybe intermediate poultry keeper. If, you, um, if you're an experienced poultry keeper, we hope that you get at least a few pearls of wisdom out of this. Um, so let's get started. So when I do this, what we're seeing is a resurgence and a, an increasing interest in keeping poultry at the house for lots of different reasons. It might be that you want to keep it just for your personal and family food security. You might want to put some layers up. You might want to get some meat birds and raise them so that you can have a harvest in your freezer. When I lecture to 4-H clubs around the state, the feedback that I'm getting from a lot of the club members and a lot of the educators that I work with is that keeping backyard poultry is one of the fastest and, and biggest growing uh, livestock projects because you can keep poultry and similarly rabbits in a fraction of the space for a fraction of the cost that you would do for a steer or for a horse or something like that and still have all of the benefits that you would have for a livestock project. So think about what your purpose is because when you start going through the various breeds, you're gonna find that different breeds are optimized for certain things. There are breeds that for meat production, they will reach a harvestable size much faster. There are breeds that are um, optimized for egg production where they are going to produce eggs at a higher and more efficient rate than other breeds. And then we have dual purpose breeds. They do a little bit of both. They're going to reach sexual maturity. They're going to go into egg production. And then over time, they will reach a size that would be a good harvest size for the freezer. And then for a lot of the 4-H youth, we see an interest in some of the show breeds. So when you're getting into poultry, it is important that you know how to talk the talk. And there are, in poultry, just like in a lot of the animal species, there are different names that are given to the different uh, male and female and sexually mature and immature. So with chickens, we know there's a hen and a rooster and a baby chick is a chick. A baby chicken is a chick. A pullet is an immature female chicken and a cockerel is an immature male chicken. And when we're talking turkeys, males are toms females are hens and babies are poults. And I should say that we're recording this, so um, we won't have really a, you know, a PDF or a share of the PowerPoint, but we'll be able to have anybody watch this video down the line if they want. So here's your first consideration. And depending on where you are viewing from, this is a major consideration. The rules and regulations of where you live are going to very, be very important in terms of if you're even allowed to keep birds and if you're allowed, what kind of birds are you allowed to keep and in what number? And I, I share the story of what I have in my situation where I live and I am not allowed to keep poultry. Um, my regulations in my little city say that I'm not allowed. On my street, if you went north about five or six houses, it transitions from my suburb into city of Columbus. That happens even before you get to the stop sign. In city of Columbus, they're allowed to keep birds. So on my street, on my block, I am not allowed to keep birds, but my neighbors six doors down are allowed to keep birds. So make sure that you check with the uh, municipality that you live in for the rules and regulations of how many birds you're allowed to keep, what kind of birds you're allowed to keep, if you're even allowed to keep them. And then the reason I put a FedEx box on here is uh, what is unknown to a lot of folks is there's a there's really a couple of ways that I recommend that you get your birds. And one of the common ways is that you're going to get your birds from a hatchery. And when you purchase a bird online from a hatchery, they will commonly be mailed to you as a one day old bird and they will arrive on your doorstep as live livestock in a box and they've been mailed to you. And so um, 
that is something that you need to take into consideration in terms of your timing for when you order your birds and especially we'll talk about when you want to have all your equipment ready for when that one day old baby bird shows up in terms of your brooder, your housing, your feed, your water and all of those other things. So I recommend that when you go to find your chicks that you get those chicks from a hatchery that is an NPIP approved hatchery or they got their birds from an NPIP approved hatchery. And what that means is a hatchery, and we'll go over what NPIP means here in just a minute, but that is going to assure that they're coming from a place that has the most um, secure biosecurity and testing and things that they've had in there. Most require ordering a minimal amount, especially when we're in chick season, which is where we're at right now. Think of baby birds as one day old livestock. Don't think of them like if you're ordering from Amazon or from Lowe's or any other thing like that, like it's a toaster where they just have them on the shelf and they can pick out whatever you want at any time. They have to plan the hatch ahead of time and they have to plan the certain breeds that they're going to have available ahead of time. And depending on what time of year you order, you're may be able to order one or you might actually have to order a 10 or a dozen or two dozen or something like that. So if you're in a municipality where they have a regulation that you're only allowed to keep say three birds, you find that if you order 10, you're going to have to figure out what to do with the remainder. So the National Poultry Improvement Plan is what NPIP stands for. It was established in the 1930s with the original focus to eradicate Salmonella pylorum, which causes pylorum disease, just an absolutely devastating disease of, of not only backyard flocks at the time, but commercial flocks at the time. The 1930s were much different now than they are, or not much different then than Ohio is now. When you think about how large poultry production facilities uh, were run. And back in the 1930s, it was very common for about everybody to keep some poultry. And so when pylorum disease was going through with that very high mortality rate, the government decided that they needed to develop a program that they could use to ensure the safety of our food supply in terms of eggs and meat out of poultry that way. And so they came up with the National Poultry Improvement Plan, which uses a combination of testing and vaccine to make sure that we've eradicated that disease. It has some other voluntary components where they ask these hatcheries to develop protocols and testing around for a couple other salmonellas and then a few mycoplasmas as well as high path avian influenza. So when your one day old chick shows up, it's going to be in a box, it's going to be cold, it's going to be cranky, and it's going to need to go into its nice warm place, and that is called brooding the chicks. So when we brood the chicks, we're going to put them in a clean, dry, warm, ventilated space that you've cleaned prior, meaning that you've already cleaned it, sanitized it, and you've let any of the fumes from any of the cleaners dissipate, right? When livestock is shipped, regardless of what species it is, that's a very stressful time in the, in the life of the livestock. And so when that chick comes in, it's gonna be stressed and to place it in an enclosure that might have poor air quality is just gonna stress it further. Make sure that you have enough space for the water and the feeders. And you're gonna start with a clean and dry uh, litter on the bottom shavings because little baby chick legs are like little plastic things and they need to have a little traction in there to avoid injury when they're inside their brooder. And then it needs to be heated because it's not with its mama anymore. It needs to have artificial heat placed in there. And then that is going to be decreased over time until it is able to thermoregulate on its own. So when we brood chicks, we start with 90 to 95 degrees and that is measured. And the easiest way I found to measure is you get one of those oven thermometers, like the old style metal ones that actually were put in the oven. They're about the height and the size of a baby chick. So you put that right underneath your heat element and you check that daily. That allows you to measure the temperature at the level of the baby chick. And then you decrease that heat five degrees per week until they can thermoregulate on their own. It takes about six weeks and then you monitor your chicks very carefully. And so when I say we monitor our chicks very carefully, um, when you take a look over here, I don't know, can you see my cursor on the, um, 
thing, Carrie? Yes. Okay, yeah. so when we're looking over here, and, and this is a picture that was taken at the Tractor Supply in Logan, Ohio, and another place that folks will commonly get birds would be like a Tractor Supply or Rural King or any sort of agriculture store that you can find out there. They should still be open because underneath the, um, the guidance from the state of Ohio, agriculture enterprises are generally allowed to be open. You'll have to check with them to see if they're going to have chicks at this time, but this picture was taken a couple years ago in the tractor supply in Logan, Ohio. We have um, basically a stock tank. It's got some litter on the ground and there's a whole bunch of chicks that are on, in there. Some are, some are piled on top of each other. Some are eating, some are drinking. You'll notice that baby chicks are about the messiest critters that ever existed. They make a baby Labrador look like a clean and sterile surgical environment. They're that messy. They will back up to the water, they will back up to the food and they will poop and pee in it and then they will scratch it all over the place. Generally, I don't recommend the feeders and the waters on the ground, but baby chicks are only tall enough that that's as high as they can reach. So you're going to want to get in there and do a lot of cleaning. But when I look at this picture and when I was in the tractor supply, this was in probably March and it was cold at the time. And this is right by the front door. It's the first thing that people see when they walk in there. And that heat lamp was placed pretty high up over the baby chicks. So I see all these chicks that are kind of piled on top of each other. And that's kind of a clue when I look at that, that maybe there's not as much heat as needed in that brooder and those chicks are piling on top of each other to stay warm. That can predispose them to injuries. So close monitoring of the temperature in the brooder is key. A lot of 4-H projects, um, they have Chick Quest and other things like that. You can incubate your own. Um, you, you can get fertile eggs from any number of sources. Uh, as a veterinarian, I'm not a huge fan of that because like as not, you're probably not an NPIP approved hatchery at your house. And so when you're starting with these eggs, you don't have the ability to do some of the vaccines or the testing that would be done at a hatchery. And then keep in mind that when you hatch out fertile eggs, the, the saying is you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. If you were looking for layers and you had a dozen fertile eggs and you got lucky and all 12 hatched, you might have 12 cockerels that turn into 12 roosters and you're not going to get any eggs at all out of those fellas. So um, I know a lot of folks do this, especially uh, when I worked out in the country, they would keep a rooster around and they would have a constant replacement source of birds into their environment. Just make sure you understand what you're getting into if you want to incubate your own. So do you need a rooster? Um, you don't need a rooster for egg production. Hens are going to lay eggs when they come into sexual maturity and those eggs are going to be coming out whether there's a rooster present or not. Those eggs are going to be infertile. That's the exact same kind of egg that you get when you buy eggs at the store. Those are infertile eggs. A rooster is only needed for fertile eggs if you want to hatch chicks. And depending on where you live, you might not be allowed to have a rooster. Um, City of Columbus, I can tell you the ordinance is that there's no roosters allowed at all. They only allow layer hens. So one of the other things to keep in mind is while most chickens are pretty docile, depending on what breed you get, roosters, when they hit sexual maturity, they can get a little bit aggressive. They can be noisy. And while most chickens uh, are not armed, roosters have a couple of weapons and they can hurt you. They can put you in the urgent care. So be real careful when handling a rooster that way. If you don't need one or if you're not allowed to have one, um, keep in mind that if you're just looking for eggs, you do not need one. If you are ordering from a hatchery and you want to make sure you only get Layers, make sure that you request only hens and not straight run. When you see a listing for straight run, that means that the eggs can be either males or females. And like I said, you could order 10 of them. And if you wanted 10 layers, you might end up with 10 roosters. So this is a screen capture from a common egg laying operation here in Ohio. And this was done back in October. And at that point when it was early uh, or it was late in the winter and it was not when people were commonly buying layers, they would be able to sell them in tiny amounts that way. 
and what they had was not every breed available. They only had a small amount of certain breeds available just to make sure that they had something to sell to the customers. They had straight run at 287 for one. And then if you wanted hens, that was a little pricier. And then sorry to say, fellas, um, the dirt cheapest ones that you could buy were all of the males that way. If you go to an ag store like a tractor supply or rural king it's very common that they'll have about maybe three four five different choices of birds that you could pick from they might have one egg layer breed out there they might have one meat breed out there sometimes they'll have a show breed if they have a a lot of sales that way mm -hmm. but what you'll see commonly is a um a listing for what's known as sex linked and what that means is avians have some different chromosome sets that way and what they found over time is is if they take one certain breed and they made it to another certain breed that the birds come out with different colors per sex and that allows them to know what a baby bird sex is right off the bat very talented hatchery people, believe it or not, can sex a one-day baby bird and tell you if it's a male or a female. I am not that talented. I cannot do that. So if you wanted to go to a store and pick your birds out, you can do that. Uh, if you see it's listed for straight run, you don't know what sex you're going to get. If it has sex length, then that color will determine um, the sex. And so that allows folks to pick to make sure that they get a layer when they're purchasing birds. So let's talk about the basic needs of chickens. And, and chickens basically need the same thing as we need. They need food, water, and shelter. But they also have a few wants if you're able to do that. Chickens ideally would like temperature in a range very similar to what we would like to have that 65 to 75 degrees that's their ideal temperature range they can tolerate temperatures outside that range very similar to how other livestock species can tolerate temperature changes if it's hot they need a place for shade and they need a good source of clean fresh water so that they can thermoregulate with that if it's cold, they can tolerate that as long as they have some shelter, they're not wet, and they're out of a draft. So think of the difference between a 40 degree day where it's cloudy and it might be misty raining and you might be really, really cold, or there might be a 30 de degree day where it's bright sunshine and there's no wind at all and you can feel warm. There's a big difference between um, that sort of wet environment with air movement as opposed to a dry sheltered environment. And then the other things that they like is they're very social and a lot of folks that keep backyard poultry, one of the things that they enjoy about it the most is they really get a fun interactive animal that they get to work around. Chickens are fun to watch. Um, they're very social. They like to have friends and they like to be able to investigate their environment that way. One of the things that is uh, a negative impact on chickens similarly to a lot of other species is they would like to have freedom from fear and stress and the problem with chickens is they are very close to the bottom of the food chain for for a lot of different species that is kind of the reason why they reproduce themselves every single day lots of things like to eat chicken and the reason is because they taste like chicken so think about how a bird is going to be stressed out. When they're in a coop, they're going to have predators trying to get into the coop. And so freedom from fear and stress is something that is going to go a long way towards making sure your birds are happy. And that includes predator proofing them um, and making sure that they have a safe habitat. So let's talk about feed and feeding for a second here. One, chicken feed is eaten by just about every single critter on the planet, including humans. You need to store that feed in a rodent-proof container, ideally a metal container that is off the ground. And then when you have a feeder, I recommend a feeder like the one that's seen in this picture. It is held off the ground and that is going to minimize waste and that's going to minimize contamination from the birds. It's going to be very difficult for that bird to back up and poop into that feeder when it's off the ground like that. And then if you'll notice this feeder is held right around the level of the back of the bird so she can get in there and she can get her food but she can't necessarily 
scoop feed out on the ground, which they very commonly do. And, and so that minimizes wasted feed. I like them to be very sturdy. I like them to be cleanable sterilizable if that's possible. So when I look at that, that's a feeder that you can sterilize and clean. It's super heavy duty. It's held off the ground. It's going to be able to hold feed and minimize waste and minimize the chance that there'd be some vermin or some other critters that would get into that. Commercial feeds are available. There's a wide variety that are out there. Uh, primarily they're corn and soybeans and then they have a vitamin and mineral added to them very similar to how feed is, is mixed up for livestock of a lot of different species. Although birds have a different sort of pathway in terms of the formulations and that is there are different formulations for the birds that change based on not only the life cycle of the bird as they age, but for what their intended use is as well. So starter feed is higher in protein, right? Because they're rapidly growing. You feed for at least five weeks. Generally folks feed through that brooding period. Or, and this is one that you would not let your layers get into it because it is not calcium supplemented that is going to be able to be used for egg production. It has a smaller particle size so a chick can ingest it and generally most chick starters are medicated with the antibiotic amprolium which is a coccidiostat. So coccidia are a protozoal parasite that we'll talk about a little bit down the line and what they do is they feed a small amount of this antibiotic in the feed and what that does is it helps the bird generate an immune response to the coccidia by limiting the production and the reproduction of those coccidia. The, um, the, the, the birds need to generate that immune response over time because they are gonna be exposed to it later in life. And just like a lot of species, they're going to increase their immune response slowly as they develop. Uh, poultry are one of the four species that has the most problems with coccidia and that would include uh, bunny rabbits, poultry, um, puppy dogs, and small ruminants, especially goats. This is an antibiotic, but you still can buy chick starter over the counter. It doesn't need a VFD to be purchased because the amprolium is not a medically important antibiotic to humans. Grower feed is what you feed after chick starter until they reach sexual maturity, which is about 20 to 22 weeks. You need to add grit to the diet. And what grit is, is basically a sort of a, that rough um, sort of like stone or oyster shell that goes into the gizzard that assists them with grinding. And then this is fed as they get to um, sexual maturity, which if they're meat birds, they're not gonna get anywhere near that. Uh, if, if you guys are unaware, if you're raising birds for meat birds and you pick a breed that is optimized for meat bird production, they can be freezer ready in as little as eight weeks. So they're not gonna get anywhere near sexual maturity. And so this is a spot where I like to put a little bit about the supplementation of rations, um, which is treats. One of the things that I see when I do these classes throughout the state is we're, we're seeing a lot of backyard poultry that are being treated very similarly to like a cat or a dog because these are really social birds. And so they become members of the family. And it, it's very common for us to want to give treats to those animals in our lives that we are very, very fond of. We are seeing, however, that the more treats that we give to these birds, we're seeing some of the same medical problems that we would see in humans or companion animals in terms of obesity, especially over time. Keep in mind also that if you are raising birds and you wanna maximize your production, you wanna get them to a harvestable meat size as fast as you can, you wanna get them to optimal laying, treats can decrease that production because it takes the place of the nutritious feed that they would use otherwise for their production system. So what I recommend is if you feel like you need to give treats, it's probably best to give them at the end of the day after they've had enough of their food that they need for production. And then we would look at unprocessed only, um, not things like bread or crackers or pretzels or things like that. Hey, Tim, we got a question. Sure. Um, someone asked, what's the main difference between a chicken egg and a duck egg? Well, um, 
they there's besides the fact that they're different species and different sizes, there's going to be different um, makeups in terms of the proteins and some of the amino acid consistencies and things like that in there. So they are both avian, but they're not the same species. They're not actually even the same genus. So that would be, um, they would not be super, super close. It would be sort of like saying, what's the difference between a puppy and a kitten? So let's talk about layer feed for a second. And this is very, very important because chickens are a species where you can actually have severe medical problems if you do not feed the correct feed per production system per age and per intended use. For example, layers need a layer feed and that is much higher supplemented in calcium. A hen in production is going to produce close to one egg per day and that is a tremendous amount of calcium needed to make that shell. If her diet does not provide that calcium, she is still going to try to lay eggs. She's going to start pulling that calcium out of her bones. Over time, that can cause a severe medical problem called rickets where you can have some deformities in their legs and it can be difficult to rapidly improve a nutrition, nutritional deficiency that has um, occurred over time. Some folks have asked me over time about mixed flocks. How would you feed if you had, say, some meat birds in with your layers or you had your young birds in, in with your mamas? And my recommendation, quite honestly, is you would never have mixed flocks. Your layers are separated from your meat birds. Your old birds are separated from your young birds. That would be the proper biosecurity principles that would minimize disease and that would maximize production right? Because if you're raising baby chicks and you have them mixed in with the older birds, you don't know what kind of diseases might be in those older birds where their immune system has taken care of them and they would have uh, minimal shedding until a stressful event occurs, such as the introduction of a bunch of new baby birds, of which case then you might have some shed into that environment where the baby birds have not developed their immune system yet to handle that. And the same thing goes as if you're raising birds to a meat bird size. You might find that if you add some of those baby meat birds in there, they're going to need a completely different diet than a layer. So the easiest way to minimize that disease transfer and maximize production and use proper biosecurity would be to not mix your flocks and that allows you to feed them to their intended use uh, with the most efficiency and the least potential for disease. Hey Tim, we got another question before you move on. Sure. Um, someone asked, can you recommend what to feed meat chickens? It mentioned finisher on your slide. So um, there's a there's a tremendous amount of foods that are out there and what I recommend is you find what is available to you at your local supplier. When we when I mentioned that there's finisher out there, there is you'll be just surprised at the staggering amount of feeds that will be carried at any feed store uh, or especially a larger one that are out there and there are certain feeds that are designed that you feed them after you use a chick starter, then you go to a grower and or and it will be also known as a grower finisher diet where it is designed to put on pounds um, with maximum efficiency. All right. Good questions, gang. Let's talk about water and waters. And there's a lot of similarity with water and waters and feed and feeders. I like sturdy containers. I like containers that can be sterilized. I like them off the ground. Okay, you want to minimize contamination in there. When I teach 4-H quality assurance, I'd like to tell the students that your animals want to drink out of a glass that is exactly as clean as the glass that you drink out of at your house, but they don't have any choice in the matter. So they're going to drink out of whatever glass you give them in terms of how dirty it is. So make sure you are doing a great job with sterilization and keeping your waters clean. I recommend that you do fresh water every day, twice a day is best because with a lot of these feeders and with the way the chickens can kind of get into trouble, they might spill that water, they might knock it over, it might be contaminated in the winter, it might get frozen, they might contaminate it with manure. 
an egg is one third water and so they need lots of water to go into egg production and they're going to use water as well to cool off. Chickens cool off a lot like dogs so they're going to do that panting almost where they move air past the venous sinus in the back to decrease temperature that way so they need that fresh water checked twice a day. And so I have a couple of different um, waters that I have down here in the bottom left corner. The one with the uh, red cup is basically an inline plumbed system where folks will run a water line out to the coop. And what happens is this float raises up as the water cup fills and as they drink and it lowers, more water gets added. This one is a five gallon bucket and what you buy is you buy a little nipple system on the bottom and it goes in with some O-rings for gaskets. And I like the clear bucket a lot because that allows you to check the water level. And I like that it's sealed so nothing else can get in there. I like that both of these can be cleaned and sterilized pretty easy. But keep in mind that there's a potential for some failure with these because birds like to peck at everything and they will just peck and peck and peck at stuff. And these systems can fail over time as they fatigue. So if this float system um, defects or if one of these nipples gets a leak around it, you can get a large volume of water spill out into the coop and water is the enemy in the coop. You mix water with organic matter and manure and you're gonna start um, building up ammonia smells in there and that is gonna affect air quality negatively. So check twice a day, um, clean fresh water and clean waterers and your birds will thank you for that. So let's talk about housing. And if you want a really, really interesting thing, head onto the internet and take a look at images of chicken coops because there is the most incredible wide variety of chicken coops that are out there. I've seen some that are absolute palaces. I know plenty of people that they raise birds in one corner of the barn. I know people that use shipping containers. I know people that raise them in their garage. Uh, but make sure that you address a few very key things about your housing when you're either buying a coop or building a coop or or using something for a coop and one is it needs to be able to have good ventilation that means draft free ventilation so not drafty but good ventilation and then it needs to be predator proof it needs to be rock solid and secure one of the things i found that drives people out of keeping backyard birds is damage from predators keep this in mind the minute that you lock up your birds in that coop and you go in for the night and it's dark, predators go to that coop and they spend the entire evening trying to get into that coop to get at the birds. And so that needs to make sure that it is predator proof. And then one of the things that I love to stress is you need to make it cleanable, meaning that you need to make sure that there is access to get in there and clean. I like to say, if you make it easily cleanable, you might clean it. If you make it hard to clean, you will never clean it. And that's a super important thing. When people ask me, how often do I clean my coop? I say you should clean it as often as you clean your litter box, which is a lot. So take a look at this coop in the right corner. First off, you'll notice when you go on the internet and you look at pictures of coops that every single coop has been stuck right up against the neighbor's fence line. Your neighbors probably don't want your chicken coop placed as far away from your house and as close to their house. So make sure that you're a good neighbor and you don't take your coop and automatically just stick it next to the fence line. But then when I look at this coop and it's otherwise pretty cool, right? It's got, um, it's got a roof on it. It's got some security in there. But, but who would want to get on their hands and knees and crawl through this coop to get in there and clean that out. Not this guy. So if you make a coop that you are able to clean it, you might clean it. You make it hard to clean and you are not going to want to clean that at all. So lighting is a very important thing and I've been getting some questions about lighting sent to me. Um, birds generally, like most livestock species, they're not as close to their wild type, but they still retain a lot of characteristics of that. And, and that would be that without supplemental lighting, they're going to come into egg production when it gets to about 14 hours of daylight. And that is designed so that in the wild, they're gonna have their chicks when the weather um, is conducive 
to those chicks surviving. A lot of folks will supplement with light up to 16 hours using light bulbs throughout the time period when the light would decrease below that and that can keep birds into egg production much longer than they would normally go into production in the wild. And then I like to have nest boxes in there. I like those also easy to clean. If you make the next boxes easy to clean, you might clean them. If you make them hard to clean, you're probably not going to want to clean them. And you need to have good egg access. Egg access. So I have this picture up here and sometimes I put pictures where it basically shows a good example of something and then sometimes I put pictures that show what I would consider to be a bad example of something. And this is not my favorite way to do nest boxes. Um, I like the fact that there's five gallon buckets and those can be removed and be sterilized but boy that's a hard hands and knees to get down into those nest boxes and clean them. And then with a perch board running right above them that's going to have an accumulation of manure that's going to be potentially down into these nests and it's going to be all around them and it's going to make it very difficult to clean. And when I, when I teach folks about eggs, and we're going to talk about eggs in a few minutes here, I like to say that the easiest way for a clean egg is to have that egg fall out into clean nest material. Because if it falls out into fecal material, it's going to be dirty right away. So we just came out of winter and it was a mild winter. So I didn't get very many questions posed to me about frostbite or some other winter things that way. But hey, winter, hey, Tim. I have, hey yeah. Tim, real, Tim. Tim, real quick before you move on, we've got two questions. Okay. Um, one says, what size area do you recommend for turkeys? All right. Um, they're going to have a lot more area than chickens um, offhand. I want to say chickens are two square feet. I will I will probably have to get back with, I want to say turkeys are probably closer to five or six square feet per bird, but um, if you want to get your email to carry, then we can um, get a fact sheet to you that will have some actual recommendations in a written form, and that way you'll have them uh, to refer to. And then one last question before you move on. Should I give my chickens warm water when it's cold outside? So that's a great question. There have been a number of different research publications. I have not seen them in chickens, but I've seen them in ruminants, meaning like cattle. And when they drink water and they have to expend a bunch of energy in order to bring that water up to temperature when it's really cold outside, that can decrease production. So if you have the ability to deliver water a little, you know, you, you they're, when it's winter out and you want to keep it a little bit warm, uh, that's not a bad thing. And in fact, there are actual uh, poultry coop wa watering systems that have inline heaters in them to prevent those water lines from freezing in the winter. And David Marison just posted at maturity for turkeys up to five square feet per tom turkey. Thank you, David, for sharing that. Thank you, David. I was pretty pretty closely sure on five, um, but I wanted to get that detail. We got some, we got some good ag educators in here. Welcome on here to tonight. Yes. Uh, Tim, we have another question and I think you're going to touch on this later, but it says where are the eggs formed inside the chickens? You're going to cover that as yes, we go on, right? We have an outstanding video that I'm going to share and um, I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. It does a way, way better job at describing the process of egg creation in a bird than I ever could. Hey, hey, Tim. Yeah. Um, I know that this is a statement or a question. The Americanas can't be in the cold? Um, I have not heard that. I know Americana is a fairly popular breed here in Ohio, and I know a lot of folks that raise them. Americana is the breed that has the nickname of Easter Eggers. Um, I would say while there are a number of breeds that are um, more adapted to Ohio, uh, that is not one that I would say is unable to be raised in the cold because I know people who raise them in Ohio, but you might need to adjust um, your husbandry a little bit if you have breeds that aren't necessarily optimized to Ohio, like say the Buckeye breed. All set. There's a, what are good ideas to fix a leak on a blue five gallon bucket with the nipples? 
apparently that one seems to leak for them. Um, so it depends on the holes because what, if you have a hole that might be like a little oval or off centered, you're going to find that you're not going to get good gas gasket sealing on there. It might be that you need to take that bucket and just re-gasket it because over time you find that those gaskets can kind of crack and dry out and then you'll get a leak in them. I do find that those nipples can fatigue over time, quite honestly. And then how many meat chickens should I get usually? That is a personal decision. You'll figure out what your family need would be. And then you have to figure out what your space needs would be and your budget that you would be able to put into facilities and for feed and other things like that. One of the things I counsel folks is, I'm a big fan of, of providing for your own personal and family food security, but you're, you're not generally able to say, you know, raise your own eggs cheaper than you could ever buy them in, at the store that way. So make sure you put budgetary considerations in there as well. So um, I know a lot of folks, you know, for a family of four, they're going to do maybe 20, 30 birds that they're going to put into the freezer at one point. And then the other thing you need to take into consideration is how big is your freezer? Because 30 meat birds dressed out of four and a half pounds is going to take up a lot of freezer space. All right, so if we're caught up, let's head into winterizing the coop. So like a lot of livestock species, chickens can tolerate cold, but they can't tolerate wet and cold. They need ventilation, but it can't be drafty, right? We wanna promote good air circulation and air quality, but not drafty. And then your food and your water monitoring and your egg production monitoring are critical. If you are maintaining those light, hours so that your birds are in production. Eggs are one third water. They can freeze, they can crack. Um, the water lines can freeze. And so you generally find that your work needs to maintain a healthy coop go up in the winter. So here's a picture shared by a um, colleague of mine, Annika McKillop, of what I love for a well-built coop. So you look at this and it's just rock solid. It's predator proof. It's easily able to get into it. Um, you have access doors into both the coop and the run. The plastic is used very similar to how other livestock species will use walls to prevent draft and that you can raise and lower this plastic. And so the birds can be down here in the run. And if there's a breeze, they can stay out of the wind. But if there's ammonia buildup, then that can be drafted right out over the top. And then you have a nice sturdy roof and that diverts water away. But like every other picture on the internet, you will notice that this coop is placed right up next to the neighbor's fence line. So we have several different choices for litter that are out there. And in fact, me and my colleague Sabrina Scherzinger are working on a fact sheet that we hope to have out this year so that we can guide litter choices for backyard poultry production. Um, the four most common ones that I uh, talk about are sawdust, straws, shavings, and sand. And sawdust is one that I don't generally recommend. You can find it not uncommonly depending on where you live, especially if you live close to a mill or something like that. But the very tiny particles of sawdust can be mistaken for crumble. They can be ingested by the bird. And then those little tiny particles of organic matter, when they get wet, they are a moisture magnet. And you find that you can develop problems with ammonia buildup really, really fast with sawdust. Straw and shavings are very, very commonly used um, beddings for inside the coop. One of the problems that I found uh, in the last several years is these used to be very inexpensive bedding materials and now they're not, ex they're not inexpensive at all. In fact, uh, a, a big bag of shavings used to be inexpensive and now it's not. And in Columbus, if you could even find a bale of straw, um, it's seven to ten dollars and last year straw production in Ohio just cratered like a lot of other forage production so it was very difficult to find that so um, you'll have to sometimes you've got to really look around and that's another thing you need to take in uh, some budgetary recommendations on. So I know a lot of veterinary um, poultry specialists and one of their favorite recommendations for a bedding material is sand. And when, I'm, when I say sand, I don't mean like beach sand or tube sand or play sand. I'm talking construction sand. And construction sand is sand that has particle sizes of all different shapes and sizes. And generally you have to find that at like a building supply um, store or, or some other building supply company that way. 
generally it's thought in bulk where you would you would show up and they would dump a whole bunch in there although i've had some producers tell me that they are able to bring five gallon buckets to the um to the place where this is sold and feed it fill them up and just get that weighed and pay for it that way the nice thing about it is is it's not an organic material substrate so water just drains right through that you need a good probably six inches of depth on that to promote that drainage and then when they defecate on it 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 acts literally like a litter box material that fecal ball can dry right on top of it and then you can scoop that right off it so it facilitates cleaning now the problem is it is sand so it is not necessarily the warmest substrate for those birds to be on especially in the winter so i know a lot of poultry keepers and what they do is the run they put the construction sand out in there and then they basically pooper scooper it to keep it clean and fluff it up and then inside the coop they have an organic bedding material like maybe a pine shaving or straw all right so let's talk about eggs for a second hens make about one egg per day it's usually in the morning okay which can facilitate your harvest of that and they're wet when they come out and if you did not know this if you looked at the back side of a hen you would find that there's only one opening back there and that's where everything comes out so sometimes you have some contamination so that's where i recommend that if you want to make sure that you have clean eggs you want to have a clean coop and so when they fall out they fall out into clean nest materials you're going to see a lot of different regulations rules opinions um, and and even depending on where you live you might have a different thing that you need to follow but i recommend that you do not wash now that doesn't mean that you can't and ohio state actually has a great fact sheet um, that we can share with you when we um, that I have linked in this PowerPoint, but we, I don't have it up right now, that details the exact process that you need to follow if you want to wash your egg. Because the problem is eggs look like a solid outer shell, but eggs actually have pores in them. And if you want to wash properly and not have a potential worsening of disease, you have to have a match between the temperature of the wash water and the temperature of the egg because if you don't have those matched correctly as it's listed in the fact sheet you could actually cause a gradient where when you're washing you're actually sucking things into the egg and so i like to tell folks you can't see bacteria you can't see viruses you can't see a thousand bacteria they're very very tiny so when you wash something and it looks clean it still may be contaminated. And if you have not matched your wash water and your egg temperature absolutely accurately, when you go to wash, you might actually draw the um, pathogens into the egg. That's the reason, quite honestly, um, amongst other reasons, why if you go to a restaurant and you see on the menu that you'll see in small print at the bottom that they recommend that your hamburger is cooked all the way through and they recommend that your eggs are cooked all the way through. Um, I'm an over easy egg kind of guy. Every time I do that, I'm taking a small risk because that egg has not been fully cooked. So follow your um, recommendations. If you want to wash, we can get you the Ohio line fact sheet on how to do that correctly because I know a lot of folks are selling in CSAs or farmers markets and they know that they are not gonna be able to sell a dirty looking egg. So we can get you that, um, that fact sheet that was developed by uh, extension educators. It has the science that you need to do that correctly to minimize any disease. Um, Otherwise, in order to make sure that there's no disease whatsoever, which is the recommendations by the FDA, they recommend that you fully cook it. And there's going to be a reason in the video we're going to show next where even washing it might not be enough to prevent disease. So if you are harvesting your eggs and it is cracked or it's very, very dirty, just discard it. She's going to make another one tomorrow. And I have gotten lots and lots of questions and people will ask me, you know, how much is too much feces on my egg before I discard it? And what I tell folks is re-ask yourself that question with your favorite food. How much feces is too much feces on my hamburger before I discard it? And if they say, can I wash the feces off the egg? I tell them, ask that with your favorite food. 
how can I wash the feces off my hamburger and it is still good? Remember, you can't see one bacteria, you can't see a thousand. She's gonna make another one tomorrow. All right, so we're gonna start a video and we wanna make sure that that is um, audible. So Carrie, make sure you tell me you can hear it. This presentation is brought to you by Auburn University Department of Poultry yeah, Science. Yeah, it's good, Tim. Great. Provided by Poultry Products, Safety and Quality Peaks of Excellence Program, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. In a hen, an ovary and an oviduct make up the reproductive system that creates an egg. The yolk grows in the ovary, and the rest of the egg forms around the yolk as it passes through the oviduct. Most females have two ovaries, but birds are unusual and have only one. A hen's ovary rests against the back body wall, just to the left of the spinal column. The oviduct begins at the ovary, folds back and forth upon itself, and leaves the hen's body through the vent, just below the tail. The ovary and the oviduct occupy a surprisingly small space within the body of the hen, only a few cubic inches. But when the oviduct is stretched out, it's nearly two feet long and has five distinct sections. The infundibulum, the magnum, the isthmus, the shell gland, and the vagina. When a hen is actively laying, nutrients from the food she eats are converted into the building blocks of egg yolk. These building blocks, one-third protein, one-third fat, and one-third water, are then carried by the bloodstream from the liver to the ovary. In the ovary, tiny tissue bags called follicles fill with yolk and grow. The largest follicle on the ovary will release the yolk of the egg the hen will lay tomorrow while the next largest will produce the next day's yolk, and the next largest will yield the next day's yolk, and so on. In one to two weeks, a follicle grows from less than one millimeter in diameter to the mature size of 25 millimeters. When a yolk matures, the follicle ruptures along a line relatively free from blood vessels, the stigma, and the yolk is released. If any blood vessels cross the stigma, a drop of blood may spot the yolk as it is released from the follicle. Called the infundibulum, the funnel-shaped upper end of the oviduct envelops the ovary and catches the most mature follicle as it reaches maturation and ovulates. Then the yolk embarks on a 24-hour journey down the oviduct. When the yolk emerges from the follicle and moves into the upper part of the infundibulum, it's the only time in its progress when it is not covered by a layer of albumin. Fertilization, if it is to occur, will take place here. Some bacterial pathogens, such as Salmonella enteritidis, are able to colonize the reproductive tracts of infected hens. If these bacteria become associated with a developing egg as it passes along the tract, and before it is surrounded by a shell, they can cause disease in a human consumer of the contaminated yolk or albumin. The yolk spends about 15 minutes in the infundibulum before it passes into the magnum. In the magnum, over a period of about three hours, 
it will be covered by a dense, shock-absorbing layer of albumin, or egg white. As the albumin forms around the yolk, spiral ridges which run the length of the magnum cause the yolk to spin like a bullet in a rifle barrel. This spinning twists the protein fibers in the albumin just in front of and just behind the yolk and makes two pigtail-like structures called the chalaza. The chalaza keep the yolk suspended in the center of the albumen and ultimately prevent it from moving around inside the egg. The magnum gives way to the next section of the oviduct, the isthmus. Here, the shell membranes are deposited. These thin layers of protein wrap loosely around the albumen covering the yolk. It is as though the yolk and its layer of albumen are a blob of jello wrapped with two sheets of cellophane. The process does not result in a smooth egg-shaped structure. In fact, an egg leaving the isthmus probably looks more like a prune than a plum. The partially formed egg then enters the shell gland. Here, over the next 20 hours, the shell will form. First, a thin albumin is secreted. This thin albumin is mostly water, and it moves by osmosis through the two shell membranes into the highly concentrated thick albumin surrounding the yolk. This plumps the egg into a normal shape and stretches the shell membranes tight around it. Next, a highly concentrated solution of calcium carbonate is secreted by the shell gland and crystals of calcite form and grow on the outer shell membrane. As the crystals expand, they grow into one another to form a solid shell. Very tiny spaces left in between the crystals leave pores in the shell. Lastly, a special protein solution, called the cuticle, is deposited onto the eggshell. Gas can pass through the proteinaceous cuticle and through the pores in the shell, but the two layers protect the egg from harmful bacteria. Finally, in a process called oviposition, the egg flips end over end. This occurs through contractions of the uterus, synchronized with relaxation of the muscular vagina, and pushes the egg out of the hen's body. An important part of the egg does not form until after it is laid. When an egg is laid, it fills the shell. However, a hen's body temperature is 106 degrees Fahrenheit, and eggs are generally laid into environments that are 20 to 40 degrees cooler. As the egg cools, the inner portion contracts and forms an air cell between the two shell membranes. A chick would puncture and breathe through the air in this cell before hatching. The fully formed egg now begins another journey. Pretty cool video, huh? I want to give credit where credit is due. That was created by Auburn and that is hosted online on YouTube and it's called The Virtual Chicken if you wish to watch it again. So we got a couple of take home points there and um, that I think are very important. One is when we talked about washing eggs and, and how you want to make sure you do that correctly, keep in mind that washing might remove the cuticle. And so it is very, very important that you know and you follow the recommendations for matching the wash water and the egg temperature accurately. We have a fact sheet that was created by Ohio State University Extension that is hosted on uh, Ohio Line that can guide you with that. And then if you'll notice that as the yolk was passing down through the reproductive tract, 
it might come into contact with Salmonella aniridis, and that is inside the egg um, underneath the shell. And so washing doesn't affect that whatsoever. That is Salmonella that is very commonly kept inside the bird as an asymptomatic carrier, but that's a Salmonella that makes us sick. And that is the Salmonella that quite honestly is implicated in a tremendous amount of food safety and, 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 and food illness um, a cases that occur uh, almost on a daily basis if you're, if you're following in the listservs that way. And that's why the re recommendations for safe consumption of eggs is all eggs should be fully cooked in order to make sure that any pathogens that might be in the egg have been killed. So I get lots of questions about egg production and there are many, many, many causes that can decrease egg production in a hen. And um, what generally I try to work with the uh, clients is, is to find a veterinarian so that you can have your own veterinarian to assist you with your, with your medical potential problems with your birds. And um, we do have a website on Ohio State University Extension that lists the veterinarians who see poultry in Ohio because there are veterinarians that see poultry and uh, we can get that link to you as well. Um, but when I'm working with a client, if they don't have a veterinarian, especially since not all places do, I try to work with them to determine, is it one bird out of production, which might indicate an individual disease within that bird, or is it a lot of birds that have come out of production? And then you start looking at things like husbandry, like the lighting or the feed or other things that way. So um, chickens originally were south American jungle fowl and they like perches. They used to, um, and when they were first the wild type, they would perch up in trees. Uh, they feel safe up on perches, gets them off the ground. Uh, they need about six to eight linear inches per hen. Placement of perches is pretty good um, it, things to use in terms of your manure management protocol because if you put them right above the nests, you might have fecal material in the nests and then when they lay an egg that can fall into that feces and then you have a dirty egg. And for materials, there's a tremendous number of choices out there. Folks will use wooden boards. I've seen where there's plastic rods, I've seen metal rods. Um, there are prepackaged things that you can buy. One of my favorite recommendations from a veterinary colleague of mine was he recommended that you actually use natural material like branches or things like that because it is irregular and that sort of irregular almost exfoliating uh, effect when they perch on that can minimize some of the foot problems that they get uh, most notably pododermatitis which is also called bumblefoot. Manure management is very, very important, especially depending on where you live. A lot of folks will incorporate chicken manure into compost. And if you do that, I recommend that you would use a hot composting process and Carrie can work with you on developing your compost skills if needed. Um, in a lot of cases, if you're not able to compost it, people will bag it and throw it away. The USDA does have regulations around the um, incorporation of manure into growing areas that um, you need to follow in terms of a time frame before you can plant and harvest feed out of that. And if you need that, we can get that to you as well. But, but manure management is very, very important and it has to be part of your plan when you have a backyard flock because the buildup of manure can cause a number of different health problems as well as human health and sanitation problems because manure does have some pathogens in it that can make people sick as well. So molting is a phenomenon basically whereupon after a certain period of time in a hen's life, she goes into a sort of a reset of her reproductive system and she goes into a reset where she drops her feathers, usually starts from the head and sort of progressively works down to the tail. It's about once a year and they go out of egg production and then they refledge out with all new feathers, which takes a tremendous amount of protein and energy. And then they go back into egg production, usually at a fairly high level. Uh, this can happen to de due to decreased light if you're not supplemental lighting. Uh, this can be brought on by stress. Um, and this can actually be brought on by uh, decreased planes of nutrition as well. But if you see this, um, it's a normal process and um, 
and the important thing is to support your birds with great planes of health and fresh water in there because she's going to need that in order to grow some new feathers. So let's talk about biosecurity for a second and we're going to talk about that in terms of its importance when you are especially sourcing your birds and or you have birds at the house or the farm and you want to keep them safe. Biosecurity means that you're prioritizing and protecting the health of your backyard flock and the key is you want to have a plan in place because you want to do disease prevention. It's, it's much less expensive um, to prevent a disease than to treat or cure one that is, um, that is ongoing. So we have two different uh, types of biosecurity that we talk about that we want to do in terms of our modes of infection. Direct is bird to bird. That might be because you bought some new birds and you brought them into the flock. That might be from some wild birds that were out there. Indirect is something else was the vector or it transmitted disease to the bird. And I hate to say that most of the time that uh, indirect vector is the people. So wild birds are a concern because you have basically create an environment where you're feeding a bunch of bird seed to birds. And so that's going to be attractive to a number of other birds that are out there, including songbirds or, or some other wild birds. These can vector diseases into your flock, as well as, as if you have water on your property, you might have a farm pond and, and your chickens have access to that. You're going to find that there might be some migratory waterfowl that would enjoy that space as well. And that can be a place where there might be some disease transmission. So I like to say, make sure you know where you get your birds and you're getting them from that safe place. It goes back to what we talked about earlier, where you want to get your birds from either an NPI approved hatchery or the place that you're getting your birds got it from that safe, healthy source, because you want to start with the healthiest livestock that you can start with and that minimizes problems. I've seen birds sold on Craigslist. Um, we have birds now that are being surrendered into humane organizations because people get them and they can't keep them because they didn't know the regulations. It's very common that people can find birds inexpensively at the auction, um, but you don't know what the health status of those birds are. And when you bring them into where your flock is, that's going to cause some stress and that might predispose them to disease and that might cause shed of bacteria and virus. And so, like I said earlier, I don't recommend you mix your species, your ages, or your flocks, and make sure that you get your birds from the healthiest source that you can to minimize any chance that you're bringing disease into your flock. Some of the basics of biosecurity to make sure that you are not the vector of disease into your flocks are some of the basic biosecurity things that you can do around uh, to maintain health of any of your other livestock that you would do that. You wanna have a plan in terms of foot washing stations or boot washing stations. I like to have maybe a set of coveralls that you keep that you wear only when you're working with your birds and you keep over in that area and you put those on when you work your birds and then you take it off before you go so that you're not spreading any of the manure or other things that way. Make sure you have a great manure management plan because that can be a spread of disease potentially and and make sure that you minimize visitors that are coming to visit your birds that way, especially if they have other poultry, just in case that they might have some exposure to disease on their farm that you don't want into yours. So chickens have um, some similarities with mammalian anatomy, but they have three systems that are um, pretty much radically different than what we have as uh, mammals. And we talked about one of them, and that was the reproductive system. We're going to talk a little bit about the other two systems that they have that are much different than what we have as people. And one of those is the digestive tract. So first thing is, is chickens are omnivores. Um, I have a lot of folks that tell me that the chickens are vegetarians, but they're actually omnivores. They uh, would be very, very happy to catch and eat bugs, and they do that all of the time, and bugs are meat. Chickens have no teeth, but they do make saliva. So what they do is they take their beak and they will peck at and ingest their food that way. And that first progresses into the crop, which is a storage um, pouch that is uh, right above, if they had a, a chest, it would be right above about where that opening would be. And, and when it's really full of food, you can actually feel it. 
when their feed and their ingest leave the crop, it goes into the proventriculus, which is sort of analogous to what our stomach would be with enzyme secretion. And then since they have no teeth, their next stop for their ingest is into the gizzard, which is a muscular grinding organism uh, or organ, sorry. And then it moves through the intestinal pathways and out the cloaca and the vent. And like I said, remember, there's only one opening in the back of a bird and everything comes out of there. So the other thing that birds have that are different than what we have is they have some differences in their respiratory tract. So it's very common that you'll hear me mistakenly say like thorax and abdomen in chickens, but chickens actually don't have a diaphragm. And in fact, they have that combined open thorax and abdomen that if you remember way back in um, like high school or whatnot, that was called a coelom. And so that is one of the differences. They do have lungs, but they also have air sacs. And if you're handling your bird, the way that they draw air in is they have to expand their um, their they have to expand their rib cage. And so if you are holding onto your bird too tightly and you compress their chest, you can actually suffocate them because they are not able to take air in. Unfortunately, with chickens, they are a fairly fragile species, and a lot of the presentations that we see for disease for any of the major organ groups can be simply that they expire from that disease without showing lots of different uh, signs or symptoms ahead of time. Other signs and symptoms that they have for respiratory disease can be very similar to ones we have as people, coughing and sneezing or discharges and things like that. But one of the other differences in the respiratory tract of birds is, if you were to take your fingers right now and you press down on your cheekbones, you have those hard sinuses around your eyes and your cheekbones that way, and birds don't have that. So when they get an upper respiratory disease and they get inflammation or infection, they will actually get swelling like it shows in that upper picture where they will get a tremendous amount of swelling around their eyes and in their face. And that is actually one of the most common signs of presentation of respiratory disease. So digestive diseases are fairly common in birds as well. There's a normal dropping in the top middle of that. You have the fecal material. They don't have urine. They have urate crystals, which is the white. And then there's a small amount of fluid that comes out. Um, very commonly, they will show symptoms and signs like we would if they have digestive disease, like loose droppings. It can, it can present kind of like a diarrhea. You might not necessarily see that. Um, it's a good idea that when you're checking your birds, not only check the front, but you check the back because a lot of times some of the first signs that you'll see of disease would be that there's fecal staining around their vent. We talked about coccidia a little bit early on and coccidia is a protozoal parasite that is common in all species, um, although it affects chickens probably the most of any of the species that I deal with. And there are several different varieties of coccidia and for the bird to have protection, they have to develop an immune response to all of them and deal with that by the time they develop a competent immune system later in life. And in fact, even when they're an adult with an otherwise good immune system, if they are exposed to one of the different strains of coccidia that they have no immunity to, they can become very sick and they can even pass away from that. We have um, some additional challenges if I'm counseling somebody who wants to grow poultry in organic systems because normally we would use that amprolium chick starter when they're younger, but amprolium is an antibiotic and so it's not allowed in purely organic systems. They need to use a very controlled exposure with sanitation in order to have the birds immune systems be exposed, but in a controlled way so that they can develop their immune response. They get a number of different external parasites like a lot of life, livestock species. They can get lights, they can get mites. Um, there's three major mites that they get. One is called the red mite and that's also called the roost mite. And that one comes out only at night. And so that can be a very challenging one to do a diagnosis on because you'll notice some problems with your birds. You might see some redness or things like that. But generally, if you're not out there observing them in the evening, you might not see that mite. The northern fowl mite is a very common mite that we see. Uh, this breeds in a tremendously large uh, volume of mites 
generally clustered around the vent and um, where the humans might encounter that is if they're going to harvest eggs, they can actually have mites on the eggs that they pick up as they're passing an egg. And those mites, while humans are not the preferred host, they will bite people. And then there's a scaly leg mite that um, they can grow uh, around the scales on the feet and um, can cause some problems in that location. So one of the things that I, I want to make sure that I stress that I stress when I do this presentation is chickens are food animals. Um, a lot of folks that I know that have backyard poultry, they might have three hens and, and they consider those hens as pets because they are so gregarious and social and they're fun to be around. But they are classified as food animals and we have to treat them as such. They're used for the production of eggs and meat and they have associated withdrawal times. And there are a number of medications that cannot be used in birds, be, uh, in chickens that are um, able to be used in other uh, avian species simply because of their classification as a food animal. Um, if somebody were to come into the veterinary clinic and they brought me a chicken in one hand and a parrot in the other hand and they had the exact same disease, I have a number of drugs I can treat that parrot with and I have very few that I would be able to treat that chicken with. And so that is something to keep in mind is these are food animals and they need to be treated as such and as a vet I'm required to treat them as such. The other thing to keep in mind is um, there are a number of different diseases that your birds can transmit to you and none of these are ones that you want to have. And so when we talk about biosecurity, um, not only do you want to make sure that you are not the indirect transfer of any disease into your birds, but make sure that you practice safe handling and that you wash your hands and you realize that like any other livestock species, um, there are some diseases that they carry that could be transmitted to people and you do not want those diseases. So we've come to the end and uh, that's my email on there um, and you are welcome to send me any poultry questions that you have and then we'll see if we have any questions in the chat. We do. So do. we kind of, um, we, we had you, we had you continue so we could, um, and then we'll come back. We told the group we'd come back to questions. I think here's where we left off. Someone wants to know how to get their hens to use a drip water. They're struggling with that. Yes. Poultry generally don't do great when they are uh, changed into a new system when they're older. And there can be a lot of challenges if you change the perches, if you change the feeder, if you change the water when they're older. Um, and quite honestly, if you cold turkey them, no pun intended, into a brand new system, uh, they, can, they can have a lot of trouble adapting to that new system. And in some cases, they don't adapt at all. So my, the best recommendation would be that you would start with whatever system that you want to use immediately when you have your birds when they're young. Next question, and, and I noticed this, a, a few people asked this question in the thread. Um, how do what how do you correct soft eggs if your hens are laying soft eggs um i would make sure that you're using um fresh uh layer feed and making sure that um there's a, an adequate amount of that so that they have enough calcium to make sure that they're not having to have a decreased amount that would potentially go into egg production okay uh, can hawks break through chicken netting? Hogs? Hawks. Hawks. Um, maybe. So there's, uh, I've seen a number of different security, you know, uh, fences used. And I really like when you have a, a higher gauge galvanized wire when you're surrounding your coop. Um, like chicken wire, I, I've heard people tell me that they've had small mammals chew through that and get into the coop. And if you had just say a bird netting over top, um, I could see a hawk getting through that if they hit it hard enough, quite honestly. Okay. Uh, here's one. I'm incubating eggs and there are 16 days left. Should I use straw shavings or sawdust? So I like a smaller gauge um, shaving for when those birds hatch. Um, some people will use sawdust for baby birds just in that brooding period 
And if you're going to clean really, really good, that's, that can be used depending on how big it is because sawdust can have some particle size, very similar to crumbles, and you don't want your baby birds pecking at it and ingesting their, um, their bedding material. Should a blood spot that is consistently in the same chicken yolk every time she lays be concerning? So that is a question that I would get all the time. And, and as you saw in that video, that that is basically that's probably part of the anatomy and the stigma of that bird that her, um, her, her, her venous system there when the stigma ruptures and she releases a yolk into the repro tract is located in the same spot. But as we saw in the video, it's not uncommon that you have that blood spot um, and that is secondary to that stigma rupture, and that is um, common. And those are safe to eat, correct, Tim? Correct. If you make sure that you fully cook your eggs all the way to the recommended temperature, and um, if you would like to know the recommendations for safe cooking, uh, that can be found on the um, Egg Industries Incredible Edible Egg website. Okay, uh, here's one. I've been told instead of feeding the oyster shells, you can just give your hens their own shells back. Would this work in the same way? Um, maybe. The, the reason I say maybe is um, oyster shells are much thicker and a much larger particle size than an egg shell. And so an oyster shell is going to persist longer in the crop before it sort of gets broken down than an eggshell. And that particle size might be so small that it would break down faster and might not be as, so it might not be as reliable of a source of calcium. And then I guess, you know, you, a lot of those oyster shells that you can get, they've been, they've been sterilized and they've been broken up to that particle size when you purchase them. Whereas, you know, it, is feeding the eggshells back to them, is that sterile, A, or is that potentially a disease vector transmission, which would be a worry to me, and is the particle size going to be helpful? Um, potentially, is it a source of calcium? I know some people that do that, uh, but, but I really worry about not matching the correct amount of calcium needed for a layer because I get so many related questions and problems posed to me from um, egg problems related to insufficient calcium intake in laying hens. Okay. Um, I've been told eggs can sit unrefrigerated for three months if they're not washed. Is this true? I am not a food safety expert and so I would recommend you contact your FCS educator to ask that question. And we have an FCS educator in Morrow County. Her name is Candace Hare. Um, there, here's one, the next one. Um, I have a hen that lays eggs without the hard shell present. We never eat her eggs and she, they, he, they've not been able to pinpoint which one it is. Is there any additional thing they can do? And they are assuming that it might be one of the older hens. Um, I, my I first question was going to any be- insight? Well, my, my question was going to be, how old is that hen? Um, because that sounds like she might have a defective shell gland. We do see some um, egg production problems in hens as they age. So I would, I would try to figure out which one is um, that way by kind of maybe selectively rotating them into air, their own space so that you can figure out which one is doing that. But my guess would be that with an older hen, she's having um, some internal reproductive issues, probably with her shell gland. Becky, this next question looks like it may be for you. How many chicks do you get when doing 4-H? Many times that it depends on your county requirements. Um, I know we have people here from um, across the state and even some across the nation. Um, that just depends. I check with your local, um, your county office to see um, what requirements are as well as, but we, um, we always recommend out of Morrow County that you, uh, when you're purchasing, especially your broilers or your, your 
turkeys that you always get at least five to start out with in um, our world. Um, just because Tim's talked about the, the things that can happen in, in their livelihood. Recommend recommendation, Tim? Um, I think that's an outstanding recommendation. Um, I, I have had a lot of people tell me that they've had some pretty high mortality, especially in turkeys, trying to get them from um, all the way to fair. Same here, same here. Uh, the next question is, how long does the chicken use the air cell in the egg? And if the air cell is not large enough, does that make the bird die or does it come out early? Um, if the air cell is not large enough, then the, the chick can pass away. And um, as to how long they use that, you know, I would have to review gestation period of a chick. I don't do really any work with eggs, if that makes sense, because that's not one of my clients. Um, I've gotten lots of questions that are sort of egg related um, over the years. And uh, I can, I will be very honest saying what I know and what I don't know. And I don't do much with eggs because that is not anything that there's any veterinary stuff I can do with. Okay. Uh, somebody would like to know, um, can you, should you use a perch for meat chickens? Um, you know, generally, they're not going to get to the point where they would ever need to use a perch. Okay. We had one, a question from, um, they had a chicken that laid a very large egg with another egg inside of it. How does that happen? And also, how do chickens lay double yolked eggs? Uh, so you would have two, so for the first one, um, I've heard about that where you have just some transition time problems as it moves through that reproductive tract. And, and that's not very uncommon uh, for you to have some odd eggs periodically. Because if you think about it, we've basically taken uh, a breed and we have over time hybridized it to, to do what it does not do in the wild. And, and so having problems occur periodically is not unusual. And a double yolked egg basically just had two follicles release and moved down the pipe at the same time. Uh, somebody wants to know they have two Rhode Island Reds and one Plymouth Rock. Is that going to affect their health? And you kind of covered that already. Uh, the Plymouth Rock also sometimes quits laying for a while. Does that have anything to do with being the odd one out? Maybe. Certain breeds um, do better in terms of social um, interactions than other breeds that way. But for an individual bird going in and out of lay, it would be pure speculation on, on the cause. You know what I mean? Just to kind of, I would just be making up something at this point. Hard to say. Uh, someone asked about watery poop. Should they be concerned? I think you kind of covered that one as well, unless you have more to add to that. I would say that you would want to see if your regular veterinarian sees poultry, and maybe if they don't necessarily see poultry, see if they would be willing to run a fecal examination for internal parasites on your bird, because generally they or their technicians um, would be able to examine that for you. But um, if your bird is experiencing any kind of medical abnormalities, uh, just like with any other livestock or companion animal species, I recommend that you would uh, investigate that with your vet. Uh, someone, I'm assuming they're asking about mites, but they said when they were holding their hen, uh, they were all over her. What kind would those be? That would just be me guessing. Um, but if it was in the daytime, my guess would be the northern fowl mite. Very, very tiny and breed in very large numbers. Okay. How old can chickens get? I've heard people tell me they have birds 8 to 10 years of age. And I think Tim answered the question about um, kissing your chickens. Is that okay? I think we've already discussed that. I highly recommend you don't. And take a look. Does that girl look like she wants to be kissed? No way. <laughs> Fellas, that is not the look you want to see. That is a 
unbelievable biosecurity disaster. I pulled that picture off the internet. I'm assuming this is in our 4-H question. I'm taking quail this year. Is there anything special I should know? Anything special about quail, Tim? Um, they're going to have their own sort of special um, feeding and, and, and otherwise size requirements and husband room requirements and everything like that. So make sure you do your research on making sure that you are feeding them the way they need to be fed and that you have the proper size and, and other things for that and make sure you get them from a source that you get the healthiest birds you can get. You also want to take, check with um, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources um, for their regulations as far as if you need to be registered. Are quail a 4-H species? Like uh, chickens or turkeys, I didn't think quail were one of those. But honestly, I don't know much about 4-H. <laughs> um, here's one. What is a good sign or bad that it is time to start a respiratory treatment? Also to start a treatment for coccidia and what's the best treatment for coccidia? Um, uh, those are all things that you would engage your veterinarian to discuss with them, not not something that we would talk about in a webinar. We we don't have a veterinary client patient relationship, so Excellent. I can't give medical advice. What are the best breeds for layers in our region? Um, I'm assuming well, they're from Ohio. Yes, that's one of, that's one of our Morrow County people. Well, I mean, most commercial hatcheries are using just leghorns and because the leghorn is optimized for, they're just egg, egg factories. Um, it, then there's a number of dual purpose breeds that way. And it, but if you wanted to go with pure eggs, a lot of folks are gonna use leghorns. Okay. Um, what kind of flooring do you recommend for your coop? Plywood, cement, dirt, etc. Well, that's the flooring that would be underneath the bedding. Um, so you, you, I mean, I guess you, you're going to find the easiest one to sterilize would be cement um, or a smooth impervious surface that way. That might be not applicable, especially um, depending on, you know, your budget or your building that way. But I always recommend the, the easiest to clean, the easiest to sterilize, because if you make it easy to clean, you might actually clean it. The, the, one of the questions, the worm press over. I'm sorry, Becky, you broke up on that one. Can you do that one again? It's uh, the best, are there any good over-the-counter deworming products? So there are a few products that are over-the-counter that you can get. Um, as to their effectiveness, it, it would depend on appropriate diagnosis of the parasite from your veterinarian as to whether they're gonna work or not. There was one question um, earlier that we may have skipped over, but uh, it was, but this may be difficult. What is the most popular bird in Ohio? Three. That I don't have data on. That'd be a good question to ask a hatchery to find out what do they sell the most of. Probably what they sell the most of would be like Cornish crosses because that's a meat breed that gets to a size quickly in terms of total numbers. But it would really depend on your use, right? Because there's layers, there's meat birds, there's dual purpose, there's show birds, and probably there's different popular ones in there, but that would not be any data that I would have access to. Um, good hatcheries in Ohio. 
Uh, there's a number of different ones out there. Uh, I, I generally don't pick one or the other because I don't want to forget one and get in trouble. Right. Right. Okay, that seems to be all the questions. I didn't introduce myself or Becky when we started. I'm Carrie Jagger. I'm the Ag Educator in Morrow County, and Becky Barker is the 4-H Educator in Morrow County. So we just want to again thank everybody. It looks like some people have jumped off and that's okay, but we want to thank everybody that tuned in tonight and asked good questions. And I want to thank Tim a lot for doing this for us as well. My pleasure. It was awesome. Everybody have a wonderful night and stay safe.